Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. He's a true legend in the hunting and outdoor world, a renowned conservationist, award-winning television host, and a passionate adventurer. With over four decades of experience exploring the most remote and pristine landscapes around the globe, this man has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. Welcome to the one and only Jim Shockey. <laughs> oh, way to go. Now I've got to live up to that for the next, uh, yep. <laughs> let's just end it right there. Yeah. Thank you. It's been nice here. They look really uh, glad I you're doing. I'd front load that one a little bit. I, I always figure, you know, if you're going to have somebody into your house, you don't get them to introduce himself. So thank you for being on the silver core podcast, you know, the podcast, our core values are primarily about positivity and sharing people's passion with others. And you have passion in spades. I have been doing some research and preparing for this podcast and holy crow, the number of interests and pursuits that you have endeavored on in your lifetime thus far are kind of mind boggling. And I, I'm looking down, I mean, you've, you're, you're obviously you enjoy hunting and fishing, but you also enjoy literature and philosophy. You're a musician. You're an inventor. I don't know if many people know that, but, uh, a photographer, an author, you've got an upcoming book called Call Me Hunter, which I have already on the pre-order list for, which looks amazing, which I want to be able to talk about in this podcast as well. But, um, my hope was to be able to talk about things that maybe haven't been covered in as great as depth. And, you know, with the silver core podcast, we're always trying to find different ways to not necessarily preach to the choir or talk to the choir, but to find people outside of that. And I get the sense that's what you're doing with your book as well. Am I, am I on the right track with that? Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, I mean, we, we can preach to the converted all day long. We, we have a similar, we're kindred spirits, our mindset's the same. We, we common sense is, is common with us. So you know, there, there's a lot of people that don't, they, they would appreciate it and they would recognize it. They would relate to it, but they don't hear our message because we're always talking to each other. So, so the novel, the, the number one purpose isn't to make money. I mean, we're giving everything away. My wife and I, you know, to a foundation, everything we, you know, what are you going to do? Bury yourself with a pot full of dollar bills. So, so, mm. you know, the purpose of the novel was, was to reach outside of our core audience that, um, that already know how we feel, how we think. Hopefully, you know, that audience will also appreciate it. But, uh, you know, we, we've had doors closed to us for 60 years now. We've been vilified, marginalized in the mainstream media, stereotyped. I mean, we're, you know, buffoons that spit on the floor, no higher sensibilities. And, and that's just not true. We all know that's not true, but that, is bad news. It sells for two dollars. You know, good news sells for one dollar. Mm. They're not going to say, "Yeah, these guys are actually sentient human beings," and and they're, you know, they they do have higher sensibilities. So, you know, I felt the only way to reach out there is to play their game in their world, which means, you know, literature. They they appreciate mm. that. Um, fictional thrillers, commercial fiction. I mean, th- these are the hardest uh, genres to actually break into. And, and I mean, ask Jack Carr, he, you know, he's, mm. he's working into it in spades. He's opened the door a crack and it, thankfully, you know, he's, you know, ushering some of us in as well, as many as, as, uh, you know, he feels he wants to put his name on. And he did that with me. He got me where I, I mean, go try and get a, an agent in that world to, to represent your work, your, your creative mm. novel manuscript, and then try and get a, publisher, a big publisher like Simon & Schuster is the biggest, try and get them to read it. They get a thousand unsolicited manuscripts a week, you know, mm. when I'm told. I mean, to try and get your novel read, 
by anybody. Anyway, uh, Jack was instrumental in opening that door and, you know, sliding me through it. And now I'm going to open that door a little wider, hopefully, if this if this novel is a success. So so it is to reach out, to open doors, to be able to tell our story what, what, that we all know is, is a good story that needs to be, A, told and represented, you know, what we do, conservation, the, the, you know, the fact that we care about the wildlife around the world. That that needs to be told. So so that's why I wrote the novel to get into their world, give me a voice in their world. You know, as Shane Mahoney, he, he said something to me which really kind of stuck, and he says, you know, just because you're right, right, you can jump into that river and you can be going in the right direction where you need to go, but you're fighting the river the entire way with your hands up. You're never going to win. He says, if you can find something that's floating down the river, something that's got the public consciousness, that's got the attention of everybody else and jump on that and maybe grab a paddle and be able to steer that in a direction that's going to be beneficial to everybody, you're much further ahead. And he looked at it from the, the food connection with hunting and nature and, and the, uh, the amount that food is in the zeitgeist and whatever that 20 mile diet and all the rest and how foraging is, uh, gaining in popularity. And he says, you know, if we can tell the story through food, then that's one way we can grab that public, um, attention and say, you know, there's also the story of hunting on the side over here. How, how are you looking at doing that? Yeah, you know, the, I think the the food is a, is a, a a partial a partial solution. It's very mm. difficult to defend food as the reason we're hunting, and it'll get you out of an argument at a cocktail party with with a certain crowd. I only mm. hunt, but I do it for food, and that's the only reason I hunt. You know, I eat everything I kill. That that mm. works to a degree, like I say, at a cocktail party level, but it, it doesn't stand the test of of scrutiny. Um, you know, it, it would be disingenuous for any of us to say we hunt for food. We do hunt mm. for food, yes, but that's it, it's not because we have to; it's because we choose to. And and the cost. I mean, economically, you, you don't fly down to Mexico to hunt coos deer. Uh, you know, for food. I mean, it's just, but, it, but you can also say it's not for trophy because you're eating the food, right? So, so yes, mm. it's true. And because we may want to spend $8,000 a pound for our food, you know, mm. that's our choice, you know? So, so again, it's, it, it, but, but it, it, it doesn't, it won't stand close scrutiny. Not nowadays. I think you have mm. to have a, um, a spiritual connection with the animals, the, um, with the wildlife, you know, you have to show that we have a responsibility, a, a philosophy that includes it. And again, I, I'll bring it back to a religion, you know, where the outdoors is our cathedral, the forests, the mountains, the hanging valleys. And I think that's, that will stand the test of, of close scrutiny because we all feel it. We just may not be able mm. to articulate it. And from someone looking outside at what we do, we're, we're smiling, we're holding an animal and we're smiling. How can you be happy? You're happy because you killed something? No, no, that's not it at all. We're happy because we've, we've, um, touched our ancestral soul and, and that, mm -hmm. that's an argument or that's at least a, a philosophy that it can be argued. It, it can be defended, uh, uh, far more to, to somebody that really looks at it deeply than, than just it's a, it's the food, food, food works. You know, like I say, it'll get you out of a, an argument or at a party, but it's not, it, it, it also, it throws a bunch of the hunters under the bus. It implies that I'm okay, but they're not okay, which, you know, I, I've used the analogy. It's like a, a three-toed dinosaur talking to a four-toed dinosaur and saying, you know, I'm far more evolved than you. I have three toes. You know, meanwhile, the, the comet's coming at both of them. You know, no, you're just, argue, you're both dinosaurs. So, you know, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. Dinosaurs lasted. For, oh, I like it. Yeah. hundred million <laughs> years. So, so, so that, that's why when someone says we just, I only hunt for food. I only eat what I kill. That's great. What about wildlife management then? What about predators? You know, you're saying that you don't kill a wolf, even though the wolves are decimating the population of ungulates to the point where it crashes the population. Mm -hmm. Nature works on boom and bust. 
that's the counter argument. And then, you know, you say, well, wait a minute, you know, we've created logging roads. You know, you look at British Columbia, where I'm talking to you from right now, look at it 60, 80 years ago, there was, you know, a few logging roads, main, main lines. Look at it mm -hmm. now compared to a, an overlay map. It's like veins. It's everywhere. Well, as soon as you do that, you create uber predators. The wolves become uber predators. They run the roads now. They don't have to go mm -hmm. over deadfalls and around cliffs and cut banks and, and uh, rock bluffs. They, you know, they now have to just go down the road until they hit a track mm -hmm. or a deer that's out in the field or out in the bushes, you know, across the road to go find more food. The wolves hit that track, boom, kill the animal, come back up, run the road again. Now, you know, is there scientific proof of that? Not really. Is, is there common sense? Oh, yeah, a whole lot of it. You know, that, that's mm -hmm. what's happening. So for someone that says back to the argument that they only kill something, to, you know, to eat it and would never kill a wolf and never deign to kill a wolf, well, that, again, gets them out of the, you know, the argument at a cocktail party. But it doesn't answer what we should be doing or doesn't accept responsibility, which is management of the wildlife species on a scientific basis. So you're going to have to manage the predators. Well, I don't eat wolves. Well, okay, so the wolves kill all the ungulates, and what do you eat? Yeah, well, nature works on boom and bust. I mean, you get this constant circling around of, of um, the simple truth is that there every wildlife species in this world is managed nowadays from whales mm -hmm. on down. And and it, to think otherwise is is utopia, utopic. It doesn't, it's not the reality. And, and we have to manage. Mm -hmm. you, you can't let nature do boom and bust. Because there's 8 billion of us, us, mm -hmm. 25 billion chickens in this world. There's 6 billion goats, 6 billion head of cattle, 6 billion sheep. You know, that's where the wildlife biomass is turned into. We have to manage wildlife now. We have to because it's not nature when they wrote this boom and bust cycle over hundreds of thousands of years. It, you know, they go up, they go down, populations and the animals build up. Predators build up. I mean, yeah, boom and bust works when we're not around. But but right. So I, I I just think it's a far more complicated issue than just saying food. You know, it's it's food. I, it's not defensible in the long run. I agree. And you can't stick your finger in the bowl of water without expecting to see some ripples. And we've stuck our finger in it a pretty big way, and now we have to manage how that works. That's um, eight eight billion of us. That's, you know, there's eight billion eight billion of us. So I thought it kind of interesting. You're talking about the spiritual aspect. You talk to any hunter out there and that always ends up coming up. Mo that's something that most non-hunters might not think about is that connection to nature that somebody who's out there in the environment hunting has that deep sort of connection. And uh, that spirituality side of things seems to be in high demand nowadays with people seeking answers and seeking, you know, since COVID and everyone got locked up and they're, uh, stuck in front of social media and watching all this different stuff coming in. Something I found really interesting is a number of public, uh, figures reaching out, talking about mental health, talking about spirituality, talking about, um, Talking about how just getting outside, how beneficial that is for people to, whether that's, uh, on the crystal ball, uh, side of things where they're talking about grounding and being out in, in nature and, uh, grounding their electrical magnetic field to other people, just talking about the, the, just the calming and the, um, the mental health benefits to, to being outside. I, th I think that's an interesting area that's a multi-billion dollar industry in itself, the whole mental health area, which I don't know if it's been properly, um, or fully addressed in the, in the hunting world. No, it, it absolutely has not. I mean, we, we, we know <laughs> it, we feel it. So mm -hmm. do I need to tell you about it? Yeah. You know, we know when we're sitting in a camp over a campfire and the sparks are going up and the Northern lights are above us and, you know, we have our cup of coffee, whatever it is, you know, cowboy coffee and, and we've had a good meal. We've worked hard all day, fresh air. We know it, but, and we'll talk about it. We feel it there, but it, how does that translate to talking to everybody else that's not out there? The ones chasing a second car, a bigger TV screen, a, you know, a fancier restaurant. They, they've, they don't understand because they're not doing it. And now when they're faced with their own mortality, 
say, holy cow, my, you know, this construct of my world is, is actually, you know, it's an upside down pyramid. It, it's really tippy. Again, mm. a billion of us. It's a, it's a tippy world we've created. And, and when it goes, you know, tips over or at least shakes, they, they suddenly realize, whoa, you know, these constructs that I've been working for that I think are so important, uh, you know, uh, Oscar de la Renta designer dress. I mean, I don't even know any of these. I know. <laughs> you, you sound the right. It's terrible that I can actually name a couple of them. Chanel, Coco <laughs> Chanel. You know, when you when you're striving for that, and that's the most important thing, and and you know you, you have your poodle, and you take it down to Central Park, and look at my view of all the buildings, you, you, but then that that starts to wobble a little bit, and suddenly that you know penthouse suite becomes a tomb, a jail first, and then a tomb because you can't go down the elevators, you can't go down the stairwells, you're encased in this this jail of you know people that you're not supposed to be able to touch and see and and it's not natural it shakes mm. up their world and so that's mm. why of course they're going to turn back to something that's real that they can touch that they can breathe that they can feel uh, I, I i guess feel sated feel satisfied that they're living a life that is is got value because it's not value mm. to have a, a three thousand dollar suit it, you know, it is if you live with a bunch of other people that all think the three hundred or three thousand dollar suit is important. But when something like COVID comes along, and COVID was a joke compared to what's coming down the tubes for us, you know that that's coming. Mm. That, that's nature. Na you know, nature gave a shot across our bow on this one. Or I don't know, nature. Well, you know, I mean, we're we are part of nature. We're instruments of nature. Yes. So if we constructed this virus, you know we are acting at the behest of nature and and it's an experiment again you, you start getting into a big philosophical talk uh, talk on this stuff um but it, it covid shook up a lot of people's world and that's why they needed something real that's why prices out in the country went up for land because people wanted to the ability to walk out their door and and eat a radish from their garden you know, they didn't have mm -hmm. to rely on somebody far away. They could, you know, get a chicken and have it lay an egg. Um, that That's a pretty alluring life when, pardon the language, shit hits the fan. And and that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what happened, you know, and, and it didn't really, but they thought it did. And that was enough to, to shake up their world. So, so yeah, I, I, I think it's a good thing that people are starting to reach out into the outdoors, but we have to be careful what we wish for too. The flip side of that is 8 billion people. Again, I keep coming back to that. You know, mm. that's the issue. So 8 billion people living in the outdoors and wild and free. Is it wild and free anymore? Is there just 8 billion people from New York City living where we used to go and, and commune with nature? You know, and then who, you know, like I say, the deeper you go down this rabbit hole, okay, then, <laughs> then who gets to do that? You know, who does? Who gets to be a hunter? Because you can't have 8 billion hunters out there. We never did. Historically, not even percentage-wise, we never did. 10% of us were hunters, and 90% of us were support for the hunters, basically. We su we supplied mm. food, and we were good at it to varying degrees, um, you know, that 10%. And, and the others tried when they had to, and they gathered when they could. But really, they were support for, for what we were doing. We were the ones that were providing. So there, there were mm. 8 billion people. There weren't 8 billion hunters. So, you know, the whole tribe wasn't hunters. and and yeah, we're we're gonna have to. It, it's gonna be an interesting future. I mean, talk to me in ten thousand years. I'll be that. That'll be an interesting <laughs> conversation. You know, we saw it coming and we didn't do anything about it, or we couldn't do anything about it. And in which case, is there something that can be done about it? I don't know. I don't know what the solution. Take a lot smarter person than me. But I think we have to look at this whole picture in in a um, not only more worldly terms, but in in a temporal terms in thousands of years what's what's really happening out there eight billion people mm -hmm. if anybody thinks we're going to be able to maintain this population growth for another thousand years a thousand years i mean a thousand years ago wasn't that long ago i mean 800 years it ago wasn't that long. no genghis khan was running around 800 years ago only we're talking not a big long time in in uh certainly geological time it, it's a nothing so but a thousand years let's talk about it we can't maintain this growth it's impossible 
the resources aren't here. We're already, like I say, how many chickens? How, 25 billion chickens. Arguably right. the, the most adaptive creature in the world is chickens. So, so but yeah. anyway, like I say, you, 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 if you start me on that, we, it gets, it gets deep and it's not as simple and facile as just, uh, you know, going outdoors for fresh air. There, there's a far, like I say, our, we have our ancestral souls inside us. And, and when our world gets rocked, that's what we turn to. And that belief structure, that, that peace and freedom and, and serenity, a sense of why, answering why, mm. that's, that's important to us. And that's what COVID did. It, it shook up people's world. Yeah. Even if it was in sort of an illusory way, the prospect of death, re real or perceived, the prospect of everything changing on them. I, you know, a friend of mine and he's a philosophy student and he says, Trav, the only thing, the only thing that gives life value is death. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, think about it. If you had infinite resources, infinite money, that money is not going to have the same value, right? That finite level to it is what gives that item value. And so many people, I think, will go through their entire life and not contemplate their own mortality until it's smack dab right in front of them. Um, hunters, on the other hand, deal with life and death and have a very honest and intimate relationship with it, which I think is one of the areas that is possibly missing in society. I know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman in the States here who wrote on combat, on killing, on hunting, or a recent one. Yeah. Um, but he talks about how death being behind closed doors and the effects that has on society, um, that's one full tangent that, that came to mind when you're talking there. But the other one that I think might be a more positive way to even look at is if only 10% of the people out there were hunters and the other 90% were supporting them, how do we celebrate those 90% so that they feel valued for the support that they're doing? And they're a part of that conversation. When I was in Germany recently, I was talking, uh, with a fellow who's a head of firearms training and hunter education for the Bavarian region. And one of the things he's talking about is, you know, a guy goes out and, uh, he's successful on, on his hunt, a guy or a girl, and it's then incumbent on them to come back and they're buying, buying drinks and buying rounds for the rest of the crew, because they wouldn't have been successful if they didn't have the camp cook, if they didn't have the person helping uh, set things up with logistics and all the other people who play that integral role. So two different tangents, but I'll leave, I'll leave it for you to, uh, go wherever it interests you. Yeah. You know, a relationship is based on communication and when, and, and arguably respect is, is the true basis of love. Mm. When you lose respect, when you've, you're not communicating anymore, you take the other person for granted. And, and therein lies a fundamental problem with, with marriages when, and that's just on a one-to-one mm. -one level, but the same thing goes with our greater community when, when there's no conversation and, and I'm going to now flip it into urbanization. We've urbanized over the last 60 years, we've urbanized. And, and things have come pretty easy to the people in the city. So it's really simple to take for granted where their food comes from, for, as a, for instance, you know, farmers, ranchers, you know, before we were, we were agrarian, we, we were hunter gatherers. So that food came from hunting wildlife and it still does in many parts of the world. So the, the, the people, the urban urbanized majority have, have lost respect for for our skills the the ones that provide yeah. it, the, the ranchers farmers i mean they you know they'll shut down ranching because cows you know emit gases i mean it, it's absurd but, <laughs> right. but it, you know th what they're doing is that's a lack of respect it's a it's a, a lack of communication and um and ultimately it, it results in entitlement and 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 a separation and that that's what we've had we you know the urban center the, and i'm not saying every single person because i'm not going to stereotype we've been stereotyped we know what it feels sure. like and uh, but but generally they've lost touch with 
what brought them to the table. And it's only 60 years ago. Go back 60 years ago. Yeah, there was big centers, but the vast majority of the people or a majority of the people were in the rural areas with chickens, with goats, with their cows, planting their gardens, anything excess they took to the market. So the city people and the city people provided what they provided, accountants, Mm -hmm. lawyers, all those important things. I'm sure there's a lot of accountants and lawyers right now that are throwing stones at my picture. I'm ducking and weaving right now. Uh. They're they're accountants and lawyers. They're going to miss anyway. Uh, That's so, (laughs) I, 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 I'm so, I'm sorry, but you know, I mean, I, I love life. You said at the beginning, passion. You yes. Know, I, I, even even this that we're going through is a challenge, and it's it's an amazing. Yeah, I mean, wow! Look look at what we're going through right now. Look at the challenge we're faced, and the accomplishment is directly proportional to the challenge. The greater the challenge, the greater the accomplishment. So when we come out of this and and figure it out, I'm hoping we do. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, we we can stand proud at that point. Uh, going backwards to your second your second point about hunters understanding your your buddy the philosopher that you know life is given value by death that's 100 percent true and and any of us that are, are myopically going through this world thinking that they're a cosmic event and it's never going to happen to them it, it is you know it, it's and and hunters know it we you know goodness sakes if anybody knows about life and death and under, and has a sense of an, an understanding of how important it is it's a hunter I mean, I, I've seen mm. it over and over. I've met a death. You know, it's 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 um, we understand it, and it, you know, it, it it understanding it though, and putting it into a personal, you know, I guess, under personal relationship with it is a different thing. You know, and and, and uh, you know, right now in my own life, I, you know, I'm my soulmate, thirty nine years. I mean, literally head over heels in love the first date with this beautiful woman and healthiest, you know, dancer, yoga instructor, never ate a deep fried anything in her life, 66 years old, and and um, suddenly uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer, no hope, three months to live, maybe nine, if you do chemo, and, you know, it's been a year and a half, so I'm, you know, so I'm, here's me now, me, and, you know, I'm, suddenly this life and death that I've I've understood my whole life is right here, close to me. Clo- can't be closer. Your child, my, my soulmate. You know, my job was to protect my soulmate and and our family. And you know, it, it, it's not easy. It's not easy. And and I can't tell you whether as you know. Back to your point. You know, being a hunter, we have a sense of it. But you know, we went to the palliative care team the other day, and you know, they were trying to help me, but, but uh, you know, I mean, I basically said to the, you know, there's five or six of them, they're younger. So if any of you gone through this, well, no, well, you've seen other people, you've observed it, but have you ever felt it? No, well, no. So you're mm-hmm. trying to help me that's going through it right now. That's much older than you. That's seen death, seen life. And I'm trying to try not to be disrespectful because they, I know they're doing their best, right? but I don't think that what they had to offer was going to help me because I think as a hunter, knowing life and death, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that we do have a, a sense of that, and that this isn't doesn't need to be locked up behind a door and feared. You know, fear of death. I have no fear of death. I never have had a fear of death, or I wouldn't have done most of the things I've done in my life. It's it's death is just part right. of it. With, without that, it's again you're, to your to your buddy's statement, the philosopher. It doesn't you, your life doesn't have any value if you've taken away death as an option. Now you don't seek it, and the whole I, I saw a thing recently where the there was a hunter. I faced death. I'm gonna, you know I'm not afraid of death. I, well, no, you know that's not right because you you should be following the five rules of being a hunter, which is safety, 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 and safety. Because the whole purpose of hunting was to go out bring something back to your family to begin with, and then your greater community. Uh, to so that all of us survive. So you shouldn't be seeking out death. There's no beauty in that. There's no romance. There's no honor in that at all to go seek mm. death. And, you know, I'm going to face death. No, you're not. You should be avoiding it. You should be doing everything in your possible power to not go there. But when it happens, you should never fear it. 
and and I I don't know. I'm in this situation right now where you know, and I'm I'm trying to look from outside in at this. Um, mm. it, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting. It has been an interesting time for the last eighteen months, and and I, you know, the the future is going to hold greater challenges, and and I, we'll see, we'll see if you know. I consider myself a true hunter um, on this spiritual side of it for field to table living for every you know i've I've used my life you know endeavoring to 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 be that that hunter in every way well-rounded in every way and that means being a theologian it means being a scientist it it means being an explorer Uh, you know it means being an artist you know these are all things that people go off in their little worlds and uh, you know, never the twain shall science and, and religion meet. Well, <laughs> you know, 500 years ago, we were all of those things. We were theologians, we were artists, we were musicians, we were scientists, explorers. We were all of it. And and now we've, you know, now we don't talk because I'm this and they're that. And we explorers and separated from scientists and then hunters separated from explorers. And, you know, we just dichotomized. And so, so I, mm. it'll be interesting to see back, back to your, comment as i go through this whether it'll stand the test of of a of true the deepest challenge i can imagine you know myself facing death i i, I mean i like i say it because i'm i'm facing it. i mean i know you're facing it everybody listen sure the grand leveler of human greatness yeah and and we're just ignoring it you know but but mm-hmm. it, when it, you can't ignore it it's right there it, it's it's a different thing and i uh, i'll you know talk to me when I've gone through this, God willing, I, I get through it. You know, it's, it's, uh, you, you know, and I know right now it's, it's living day to day and then it'll be hour to hour. Then it'll be minute to minute, second to second. I, I think I'll get through that. It's afterwards, you know, cause you're starting now second to second again. Can you get it up to living minute to minute? Can you get it up to living hour to hour and, and be able to live, uh, you know, day to day? in the future maybe that's my greatest hope is just to get day to day down the road but we'll see does a hunter have have a better ability to cope with this and not fear it uh, i'm not saying you have to embrace it but you know not fear it not to run my life in, in abject fear afraid of tomorrow i don't know you know like i say we'll, we'll talk again in in uh, in the future and and i'll hopefully be able to answer those things and that's a fellow I know, he manages a funeral home and he says something similar to that. And he says, um, you know, at the event, after the event, shortly thereafter, there's a lot of support. There's a lot of people there. That's not the time that he's really concerned about individuals who've been affected by death. He says it's three months later. That's when they need their support. That's when they need people around. If the advice and counsel that the palliative care people who work in that industry was providing was kind of not, not coming up to a level that was uh, of value for someone like yourself. What sort of value or what sort of advice would you give to somebody else in a similar circumstance? Well, you know, the same thing I told them, you know, I don't try and help me right now, you know, help Mm. my soulmate because Mm. they're their help was truly and deeply appreciated by Louise. Like, and it's something I can't give because I'm so close to her. I mean, you know, Mm. so, so, you know, I'm not, this isn't about me at this point. This is about Louise and and this is, you know, her journey. And I'm there a hundred percent to support her as they should be as well. I don't need support. I'm, you know, I'm, I I don't, it's not uh, right now. Like I say, living day to day. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, that's not for me. So they shouldn't use their time up. So my advice to anybody going through this is, well, in terms of palliative care is absolutely, you know, take what they have to give, be, but make sure that it's pointed in the right direction. And maybe there's people out there that need it themselves that are the caregiver. Yeah. Maybe they need it. Um, you know, I, I'm well aware of my situation and I understand life and death and I'm, you know, I, I'm not faking trying to be strong or anything. I'm not, I just, it just is. And I accept it and, and I have always accepted knowing it's coming. 
there's no avoiding it. Goodness sakes, no regrets. So what, what's what's the worry about it? But it's my soulmate. Um, mm-hmm. So so again, accept <clears throat> what they have to give, and if you need it, then certainly reach out and and embrace what they're what they're giving. Uh, for in our particular case, this is you know it's for Louise. Afterwards, I don't know. Not never been there. It's it'll be uncharted territory for me, and and uh, and you know life is is this amazing amazing journey, and it ends the same way for every single one of us. So if we live life, and you live till you die, why wouldn't you be passionate about every single day and do what you love to do, and every single hour, if that comes down to it, every minute, you know, every second, just love and and be passionate uh and, and emb- not embrace it but but don't be afraid of it and and mm. this is, you know I, I think fear is a wasted emotion it 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 binds you up in a situation where you need to react it, it it's uh it's not a good thing it, it it's anticipatory yeah, yeah. It's exactly right you you know what to avoid you know that's what it's telling you it's but it's not something you should never fear fear I think there's somebody I have nothing to fear but fear itself. But truth, whoever said that, I I'm, I should be able to pull that quote out of whoever said it. But it's 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 the absolute truth. You never fear fear, and and fear is just a warning. It's a you know it's spidey senses. It's it, it is, and that, mm-hmm. that means okay, switch on because you're alive right now and know you're alive, and whatever's inside you is telling you uh, you may not be in the future. And and we, you know, although nowadays I think we fear discomfort more than we fear fear. We just can't even see past discomfort. We we have, we're afraid of that. So it sounds like finding value in being of service to others is something that uh, Victor Frankel, the father father of modern logotherapy, is one of the areas that he looked at in his book Man's Search for Meaning. Um, in doing my research on you, it was interesting. So Jesse reared it. I had him on the podcast before. What a great guy. And I don't know what you have on him, but it must be good because I couldn't get any dirt on you from him. Everything that was coming out of his mouth, I mean, it just sounded like a uh, family, it sounded like there's a, a family relationship. I'm in doing my research. I'm looking through government records. I've, I'm looking at things that you've done, uh, you, you speak at engagements around the world on conservation topics, all of the ones that I looked at, I was surprised and not surprised. I, I was, I, I don't know if I'd say surprised because it, it, it confirmed a suspicion from my research. I look and like, I wonder how much you charge for that event. Zero nothing. You donate your time to others. You donate your time to conservation over and over again in being of service to something that's, that's larger than yourself. And that's what I hear when you're talking about this, when you're talking about the palliative care, when you're talking about, um, your passion in life is, seems to be derived from living life to the fullest and having something meaningful and worthwhile that you're leaving behind. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I'll, I'll correct part of it. I do charge. Not the ones that I, I researched. <laughs> on the, on the, I, I get that you would. Well, I, I, I do it. Uh, you know, supply and demand is an interesting thing. If, if you make the, mm. the supply so expensive, the, 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 it's funny how the demand goes down. And, and that's, mm. I, I hate saying no to someone when they ask, and it's a good cause. And I, I would love to be able to fly to Pennsylvania and do you know, do this appearance, but I mean, it's going to take me two days to get there. Um, and it's not fun. You know, I mean, it's not, I can sure. keep myself busy. Um, and then I'll speak at the event and then two days to get back. So it's five days of my life taken, you know, and I love the idea of being able to, if I was next door, I would do it 100% for nothing. Um, I just yeah. spoke at the BC wildlife federation here a couple of weeks ago, the same night we had a hospital foundation event, um, to raise money for our hospital well, the hospital foundation here locally. So mm. I went, drove up, spoke at the BC Wildlife Federation, no charge, and came back down uh, in time to see the auction item that Louise and I donated for the auction, which, which raised the most money of uh, 
of any wow. other collection item that night. It was a night at the museum for 20 people or whatever it is. Um, you know, $5,800. So I was there and Louise went there first and she's not feeling well. So to her, it's also important to, you know, even though she's not feeling well, to make the appearance for the community to set an example. Um, and, and it, yeah, it, I think it, 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 for us at this point in our lives, I mean, I worked hard my whole life to, to get ahead, you know, quote unquote, whatever that mm. means, but we're giving it all away now, you know, that that's, we can give it back. We we're creating a foundation to give this museum that I'm sitting in right now, our hand to man museum. And it's a big place. So it's 17,000 square feet. It, it's all renovated, you know, state of the art, everything in here. Um, we're donating the land, the building, the contents, which is, I don't know, millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff, uh, natural history, cultural arts. Um, and we're, you know, planning to sell our ranch in Saskatchewan and put all that money into an endowment that goes into the foundation as well to cover expenses for 40 years. And that way it can always be donation only at the front entrance, which it is right now. It has been since we opened. I grew up in a trailer. Wow. So I've, I've never, yeah. I could never have come in if there was a cover charge. But if it was donation, I could have brought a, a tooth. You know, I found this tooth, you know, a, <laughs> a, curator, a pretty rock. Here, I caught a grasshopper mm. today, you know, and, and I would have been the curator's nightmare. But it's donation, right? So from, uh, here's the here's a quote, Karl Marx, from, from those according to their ability to those according to their need. And, you know, he got that right. He did. Yeah, that, he did. You know, that's about the end of what he got right. But, but he... That part was right. You know, if we can, we should give back to the community because what are you going to do? You know, in this museum, have a giant garage sale, sell everything and have a big pot full of money and and then bury yourself with it, you know, like a fair, mm. uh, you know, or, or worse, give it to Eva. Oh, my goodness. Our, our daughter, that's, yeah, she, she would have the most Chanel purses. I'm throwing her out of the purse. <laughs> under, under the, the bless her. But you know they're they're doing well. You, you you don't do a service to your children by giving them so much that you take away their opportunity to to succeed in their own right and to be proud of something that they created. So to give, you know, we we tend to do that. Our generation, you know, like I said, I grew up in a trailer park. A conversation every night when I was young was whether Dad would get laid out laid off and and could we afford mm. to to pay the mortgage when we did get a house. Uh, you know, that, that's, I don't want my children to have to worry about that. So I did everything to make sure they were protected from it. I don't know if it's the right thing. You know, it made me reach and try and push to my limits. And, it, you know, made me found a, find a, a soulmate uh, that we were partners in that, you know, we did this, I did this, she did that. But together, we always worked towards that common goal. That's something I'm very proud of. And my wife, every day this morning, we sat there having coffee, watching outside, you know, the, the, the quail and the rabbits and the squirrels, there's deer in our field. And, you know, we're very proud of what, what we've accomplished because we accomplished it. No one gave it to us. And, and so when you give something, you sometimes take away the, A, the motivation and, and B, you steal the, the person's life, you know, that child's life. If you don't let them actually go out there and challenge themselves, see what they're capable of. So I don't know. We're we're giving everything away, and that's uh, and I speak as much as I can for free, but there's expenses sometimes, and sometimes the places I speak at are are uh, you know they're doing good causes, but they're also making good money, and and it's you yeah know, I have to be responsible financially. So so I do charge. Sure. I know there's people. Wait a minute, he charges us to speak, but if I can do it for nothing, <laughs> I I do it for nothing. You know, I not for right. nothing. I do it because it's a good cause. And because right. I can, you know, so mm. because I can, I should. And and so I, I do my best. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, trust me, you know, good from far, but far from good. Don't look too close because, <laughs> you know, I, I have an ego too, and I, I have uh, ambitions and that takes money. Well, you know, one of our instructors and he's a damn good instructor and he says, every good instructor should have an ego. I mean, they should care if they're disappointing the class. They should care if they're not living up to a standard that they set for themselves. So ego is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think if it's justifiable ego, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, that's. That's confidence. Yeah. Confidence is, yeah. And, and it's perceived as ego from someone right. that maybe lacks that, but it. I agree. If, if you can back up your accomplishments with your accomplishments, your, your, 
I don't know, I don't want to call it arrogance, but your confidence, you know, with actual accomplishments. I, 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 give me that any day over somebody who's spouting off, but has actually done really nothing. I, 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 won't, know, na- I won't name names, but I, I could probably, for the rest of this podcast, I could come down names. Of, <laughs> not in our industry, but, but outside of our yeah. industry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny how often people who've had that struggle in their youth go on to achieve great things in the eyes of others as, as they get older. And I wonder, well, I guess there's two, two wonders in here, like three wonders now. Part of having ADHD is you, your head just goes in a million different directions and it was actually it was one of the things I looked at when I looked through all of your hobbies. I'm like, I wonder if it, I wonder if he's ever, uh, been diagnosed with ADHD because your, your attention and your hobbies are so diverse and so uh, all in so many different areas that it's, it's one of the ADHD sort of, uh, factors. Yeah. But, it, um, yeah, ADHD, I think you have a lack of, of ability to focus long-term. I, I can set a goal for myself. I did. I was 10 years old when I set the goal of this museum. I was 10 years old when I said, when I decided I was going to be a novelist someday. I started my first novel then, started collecting for this museum when I was 10 years old. Um, I, mm. have no, I have no problem focusing for decades on, on achieving mm. a goal and just, you know, grinding it out to the end because yep. you know, I, I wasn't gifted with, you know, my wife has more talent in, in every way in her little finger than I have in my entire body. But what I have is the ability to focus for decades. And, and mm. if you, you know, you might be the world's crappiest singer, but if you keep singing your entire life, all your competition kind of dies off figuratively speaking. Mm. And that's, you know, that's how really I've succeeded in everything I've done is just, you know, hard, just nose to the grindstone and, and, and focused on that goal in the end. And now I, I do have several goals. So I'll be working on this one while I'm working on this one. I mean, I'm, you know, running our little empire here. Mind you, I've got great people now that handle everything. You just can't do it all mm-hmm. yourself. And you know, I'm standing on their shoulders, obviously. But uh, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I you know, I I don't have a problem when I get passionate about something. I I'm interested in it. Truly, we, we get one life. We get one life. So. You know, I'm. I see a grasshopper. I'm excited. A rabbit. You know, if I'm hunting, uh, uh, you know, I don't care if it's a rabbit or a moose. Uh, I'm excited mm. about it. And look, look, look around us. Music. Holy cow! Have you looked at guitars? I mean, in our museum, we've got a guitar collection here. Gibsons from the 40s and 50s. Nice. Some as late as the 60s, but they're fabulous instruments. The sound that comes from them. You know, I'm passionate about that. I, I wrote a song. Um, yeah. Howl with me went to number one on the iTunes blues charts. That's my awesome. one music. That. Yeah, the, the, back in October 2018. But it was because the instrument, it was a Southern Jumbo um, Gibson from 1953, an acoustic. And I, I mean, I strummed it once and it was just, you're, you're <laughs> inspired by that. And, yeah. I, and I wrote the song and recorded it. Uh, obviously, I had some session musicians and People on our team are great musicians. Um, and it, yeah, it went to number one on the iTunes blues charts. Well, that's the instrument inspiring. Well, you know, that's a passion for music, yes, but it's it's um, it's just a joy of allowing myself to, to look in this world that musicians, holy cow, they get to sit there and create beauty out of their fingers and their brain and, and a, a work of art. I, I just, I, I just even be able to touch, like I say, there's musicians in this room right now that are a thousand times better than I am. And, and, uh, and, and that's the truth. And, but, you know, it, it just to be passionate about and, and love these things that we're, we're given. It, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's not ADHD. It's just, just a love of life. This one life we get to live. And I, from the very beginning, once I was well, about 10, I, I, intended to live that life at 100 miles an hour and never stray from that path that I'd set for living this life. And, you, and I say you drive for half a century in one direction with no no side 
turns, you know, you, you end up somewhere. And this is where I've ended up in my life, totally satisfied and and still loving the idea of of challenges like writing this novel. You know, I, I wanted to do that since I started when I was a kid, but I had no story to tell. You know, I, I hid mm. the, my manuscript behind a loose brick on our in our our house. And and I was gonna write, be a novelist, you know, about well, page eight. I realized, holy cow, I don't even hardly know how to spell. I don't I don't have any so you know, I, we played hide and go seek today, you know, Cowboys and Indians, whatever we played that day, it, I really don't have a story to tell. So I, I filed it. I tried in 96 or 91, 91, 93. I wrote a novel called The Lordly and it was okay, you know, but my skill wasn't good enough. I wasn't, I hadn't honed that craft, the right, the actual being able to tell a story through words on a piece of paper. Uh, and, and so it's good. You know, I still have it. I never published it. Um, why, why'd you hide it? Hmm? Why'd you hide it behind a brick as a child? It, it was actually in our, in our, um, we had a den when we finally bought a house. It was a little 1100 square foot house, but it had a little den with cork floors and it had a, yeah. uh, it had a real fountain in that den. The people that originally built the house in the early fifties. Cool. And, and so this, but, but the, uh, fountain didn't work. Somebody put tadpoles in the, in the little concrete fountain in our house. I don't know who it was. And they went into the, and they plugged it up and then it rusted. Uh, but the, there was loose bricks actually on the side of it. And if I pulled those yeah. loose bricks and nobody knew just me, I could pull the bricks out and hide it in behind it. So it wasn't outside the house. It was inside the house and in, in these bricks on that, that, uh, just a quick side story on that. Um, my mom and dad, when they got a little bit older, they sold the house. Um, and they moved into a condominium when they were in their late seventies. The people that bought the house just recently, someone got a hold of me through Instagram or something, DMs message, and, and said the people across the street were tearing, you know, or doing a renovation. And they found one of my time capsules that I'd put back then <laughs> with, with the important yeah. things. And, and I've been trying to get a hold of those people to find out if, if it was, if I put my manuscript in that time capsule, because that's how my cool. brain worked, always thinking ahead, thinking ahead. It's yeah. going to be important. Someday someone's going to find this and I'll be famous and I'll, you know, they'll, that'll be so cool when they find that. I was thinking of them that, that, you know, how cool would it be to find, you know, whatever Mark Twain's time capsule he put in a, yeah. in the wall of a house when he was, you know, when he was 10 years old. Um, of course, I didn't quite get to be Mark Twain, but, uh, you know, I was thinking that way when I was young. That was my, my ambition. My, my goals were, were lofty even at that age. Well, the, to me, the thought of hiding the work that you were working on inside your house behind a brick would suggest that it's something that's probably deeply personal to you. Would this Call Me Hunter book be a reflection of that? It's, if you read Call Me Hunter, it starts with a little boy who's 10 years old um, in a place. I don't want to give it all away, but um, mm. let's just say that you know, to the second part of your, your statement there, the, the call me hunter is based on a lot of truth. I, I did not have to make up very much in call me hunter. Uh, and what I'll tell people is that it's 80% truth and the 20% that'll put anybody in jail, that's all fiction. So it'll be, <laughs> it'll be, it'll be up to everybody I to like figure that. out. Yeah. And, it, and I it, like that. It, and that, that truly is what the, um, that's why they took the novel, Simon and Schuster. They, they haven't seen anything quite like that. I wrote in second person for parts of it, uh, which isn't done in a novel and, and, and third person, I mixed them up and, and, uh, it, it's because it's so close to the truth. I mean, I didn't have to make it, I, I've lived a life that I didn't have to make a whole bunch up. So it'll be that they, they loved it because they couldn't tell like they, they, by the time you're reading it, you don't know if it's, <laughs> It will, you know, and, and even Mark Sullivan wrote it or re read it. Mark, he got one of the advanced reader copies. Mark Sullivan, fabulous, uh, you know, best selling, number one bestseller twice at least on the New York Times uh, bestseller list. Um, he and and he he emailed me from uh, Dubai, I think, or Arab Emirates, somewhere up there, and and uh, mm. he, he said he said I've been reading it on the airplane. He said you've you've what was it uh, you've captivated me something something to that effect and he said that's what a good mm. novel does and he said i i put it on my cell phone so i can keep reading it in the you know for the rest of the day here and and he said he 
you know, if I if it's his quote they as he was reading it, he it was difficult to tell what's real. There's so much real in there that he knows is real. What isn't? Mm -hmm. the, yeah, that that's the beauty. But it does does start back when I was, or no, it, the character in the book whose name is Hunter. It starts at um, the age of ten for that character in the book. Um, yeah. So so you know, it, as far as hiding it, and and it was a close to home. I I probably hid it because it. Uh, it wasn't that good, and I didn't want anybody, my sister in particular, to get it. My younger sister is a great writer, you know, truly talented, yeah. and librarian in her life, and read has read more novels than anybody I know. Um, you know, I probably didn't want it to fall in her hands, and uh, <laughs> and then be critically panned before I even got the darn thing past page eight. So that, that's more 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 likely the reason that it was personal. So I'm I'm looking at the time, and I'm very conscious of your time here. I have a whole ton of other things that I'd have loved to be able to uh, go on, but I realize you do have other appointments you got to be at. I got some stuff on your handwritten journals, your mentorship you do, bird watching, charitable work. Um, we'll, we'll answer them real quick and we'll, you know what, we'll go into them another time too. We can go in more in depth, but um, just your, your list there, my journals, I just my journals from my travels in Africa were over a million mm -hmm. words. Uh, a long oh. novel is 130,000 words. So I had over a million <laughs> words, just my, just my journals from Africa. Um, we're going through those right now. Uh, someday they'll be published. I'm not sure if they'll be posthumously or when they'll be published, but, but they, they are being, I, I, I think we've got it down to 180,000 words. Ken Bailey is a dear friend of mine and, and a great writer and technician. I mean, he's, he's my go-to guy when it comes to, cleaning up that kind of work. Mm. He's, he's just good at it. Um, so yeah, my, those journals are, that's just Africa. Then there's North America and South America, South Pacific, Europe. I mean, they're, they're, uh, Asia. They're, they're, there's a lot of words in those. I kept journals religiously. Obviously I'm obsessive compulsive, maybe not. As <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, I thought it would be important someday. So, so I, I kept journals for that purpose. I've, I've, and waiting in the wings, I've got five books as well that are, Call Me Hunters is my most, that's the one I really care about. That's uh, not care about, but that's the one that I need to put out for that comes out in October. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we, you, you know, you can pre-order it already. Just Google Call Me Hunter, but I have, I've got, I've got four other books that are done Four, five, four. Um, the ones on bear guiding stories that, you know, just stream of consciousness cool. stories it's all done ready for it's copy edited ready for design um there's another one there's two humor books that um if i have any talent writing it's probably humor and that's i did that for uh, under pseudonyms for a long time ace tadler ace tadler yeah there you go <laughs> yeah you knew it um yeah. so those books are ready for design as well they're done and then another one a family one i wrote this last year 53 stories. Um, there are questions that I answer, you know, as we're going through this journey, Louise and I, over this last year, and about her past and my past, and even our grand, our parents and grandparents, you know, the, to tie it all in for our kids along with photographs. Um, that's a 480 pages, and it's it's uh, being copy edited right now, um, you know, then plus my journal. So those are all waiting in the wings to come out, but Call Me Hunter is the most important right now that's the that's the one that's looming um mm. what was your your second was it poetry you asked poetry oh yeah poetry we didn't talk about a ufo encounter brain teasers puzzles magic um all, all of these other things that i've researched on here but we we've got a lot of material for um uh possibly a future podcast but i like I say, very conscious of the timings that you have here. Yeah, but <laughs> believe it or not, I'll tell you why I'm on a timeline today. About last July, what are we right now? We're we're in uh, almost June, um, mm. so it's been almost a year now. I, I was playing golf one day and my knee hurt, so I, you know, I go, oh, that's kind of weird. And I always carried my clubs, did it, you know, and and um, it's my knee got swollen and sore. I couldn't sleep. I uh, after a month, I had it operated on or scoped out, and I played mm -hmm. in our. I didn't play golf for that whole time. 
played in our golf tournament, our club championship. I came third, by the way, with two braces on my <laughs> knees. Uh, and nice. I may have been pushing it a little bit, but it, it, um, a week after that, I started getting all like, just couldn't move. I mean, there's video of me. I, I mean, I literally couldn't get up one step. I, I just, every joint was like, never felt pain like that in my life. Um, hmm. so they stuck me on prednisone, which is a wonder drug and a horrible, it's a devil's candy. You know, it, it got hmm. rid of that pain, but made you feel like crap and it's going to kill you. So for right. this last year, they've been working on solutions and just today is the first day that they start a new type of infusion because I, I still can't work my I can type with my fingers but I can't hold anything can't anybody shakes my hand I just will hit the roof uh shoulders Ooh. I can't lift my arm above there uh, certainly can't haven't been able to golf for a year so it's quality of life is a little down on the physical side uh and, you know pain everything I do but uh today they're giving me an infusion of some new wonder drug that'll I'm sure in 10 years They'll find out that it makes people grow a third eye on their forehead, whatever. But, but that, that's what I have to go do. And I, I couldn't even have a, well, I, I wasn't supposed to have a coffee this morning, but I did have one because I think they are they probably just don't want you to go to the bathroom while you're sitting there for hours. Right. Getting confusion. So, so that's what I have to do. I mean, how pathetic is that? I have to run up to a hospital an hour north of here and, uh, and get stabbed and injected with a bunch of chemicals. So, but I mean, you know, what the heck, right? It's just, it's all part of it, right? It's, it's the game we play. It. It's its part of the journey. And, and, uh, you know, it's the price we pay for the privilege of being this age, 65 years old. So it's, you know, it, it's a privilege to get to this age and, and, you know, lucky that I got here. Uh, actually, when you look at the, the various situations I've been in. So, you know, if it means taking whatever, trying, I mean, what the heck, you know, it's just this one, you know, 40 years, no one, it's not going to make any difference, whatever that is going on today. So it, it, it's just, like I say, you just embrace life. You get one life. I mean, live it, live it with passion and, and, and love to, you know, that degree, you know, do what you love doing and, and uh, yeah, live with passion. I, I couldn't, couldn't give anybody better advice than that. Thank you so much for being on the Silver Crow podcast. We will have links in the bio in YouTube for people can order, call me Hunter. And I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, it's my, my pleasure. It's always fun. I, I love a, a good podcast interviewer. It's, it, it, it's an honor every single time. And uh, again, really enjoyed the podcast today. <laughs>